Thank you. Um, so the Respiratory Viral Dream Challenge has actually been going on since May, but um, for reasons you'll hear about in a moment, it is still ongoing. So uh, I'll give you a little progress update on where we are. So just a little motivation. Um, acute respiratory tract infections um, are most commonly caused by about 10 different viruses. And the average adult has about two or four colds a year. But more important than that, uh, respiratory tract infections are the number one cause for physician visits in the US, um, accounting for millions of, of hospital visits. Um, so any effort to um, identify early stage predictors of infection, either uh, prior to um, prior to onset of symptoms or even uh, predicting which patients will get sick uh, when exposed to virus uh, can have both treatment, uh, treatment effects um, and uh, can be useful in pandemic situations. Um, there are a number of factors that influence um, whether or not an individual will get sick when exposed to virus. Uh, these might include prior immunity and pathogen load, comorbidities, but also innate characteristics like genetics. During the course of this challenge, uh, we focus on transcriptomics as predictors for viral infection because they can represent not only innate characteristics, but could also be surrogates for some of these other factors like prior immunity or comorbidities. Gene exp uh, prior work has shown gene expression signatures that uh, can well differ differentiate patients who become sick from patients who don't after viral exposure. But these signatures uh, typically become active about 36 to 40 hours post-exposure. Uh, so we wonder, can we identify earlier stage predictors of a viral infection, either um, prior to the rise of symptoms or even uh, innate characteristics before viral exposure? So we instituted the Respiratory Viral Dream Challenge and this challenge utilizes human viral challenge data. So this is an experiment in which healthy controls are exposed to virus and monitored for typically uh, 10 days to two weeks following exposure to virus. Uh, I guess this is my pointer. Um, and you can see that some patients will become ill when exposed to virus while others uh, remain well throughout the uh, course of the, the challenge. We take blood draws periodically throughout the challenge, starting uh, pre-exposure, typically about a day pre-exposure, um, through, through time course of about 10 days. Um, and those blood samples are gene expression profiled. Uh, symptoms are also tracked in order to ide uh, identify uh, symptom load and um, nasal lavage samples are taken in order to assay viral shedding. Um, so typically these experiments run about 10 days. For the purposes of this challenge, we focus on the first 36 hours post-exposure. So this plot shows, uh, sorry, I should say, uh, the data that we used came from seven different experiments uh, representing four different viruses. So this plot shows each of the, the seven data sets and the uh, number of samples available, uh, gene expression samples available at each time point. So while by and large these, these experiments were very similar, there were some differences. And this, uh, um, gave an opportunity not only for answering an important scientific question, but um, from the modeler's perspective, gave us uh, an opportunity to uh, innovate time series um, uh, prediction models. 
So the, the uh, seven experiments were split into training and test set, where the test set was sampled from uh, three of the, the studies that had not previously been released. We developed three sub-challenges to predict symptomatic and viral um, response. The first was to predict viral shedding. The second, uh, and this is a binary outcome, the second was to predict symptom, uh, whether or not a patient becomes symptomatic upon exposure. Again, a binary outcome. And uh, thirdly, we asked them to predict the uh, log symptom score, so the, the burden of symptoms that, uh, that follow um, exposure to virus. Uh, and I'll note here that um, while these variables are tracked in um, as time series, the, the outcomes measured for the challenge are actually um, not time se series data. They're, um, they're static variables. It's only the gene expression that, uh, that varies as time series data in, the, in these challenges. Uh, we also had a very limited number of um, demographic and um, clinical data as well, but the primary predictors here are the, the time series gene expression data. We developed a fairly traditional uh, dream challenge timeline uh, where, the where a competitive phase is followed by a collaborative phase. Uh, we had planned to release the test data in four separate phases corresponding to increasing amounts of the gene expression data, where the first phase focused on gene expression data up to time zero or up to exposure, uh, viral exposure, and then in 12-hour increments following that. However, we hit a little hiccup um, just prior to the release, uh, the planned release of the test data in which the entire test data set, uh, not just the 36 hours, but throughout the course of the uh, experiment were released on GEO by uh, an unrelated party or a party unrelated to the challenge. Um, so we had to rethink the challenge uh, quite quickly. So we used this as an opportunity to invert the traditional dream challenge um, and experiment with a, a non-traditional uh, timeline in which we ran a tr uh, community phase and analysis first. And then for, for participants that submit models during the community phase, we will give them the opportunity to evaluate their, their models in independent test data, which we have recently uh, identified. Um, we immediately released the test data as a leaderboard set against which the participants could test their models um, and gave them a limited number of submissions to those leaderboards. But then uh, from those submissions, we asked them to select two official uh, submissions, one using only data up to hour zero and one using data up to hour 24 which uh, actually corresponds to a, um, a related uh, funding opportunity released by our funding agency uh, to develop uh, early stage predictors of a viral response and test those. Um, so just a little preview of, um, of the results that we've seen. We've um, we're uh, basically at the, uh, now the pointer, I can't seem to get it work, working. Uh, we're now basically here, we're uh, post deadline for leaderboard submissions and we'll be releasing uh, test data shortly. Um, but looking at the leaderboard submission results with the official um, submissions, uh, we've scored them um, and computed p-values of each, each submission. Uh, here we've plotted the pp plots of those model p-values so we can examine the aggregate um, set of models to see if we're actually seeing signal in the data. So the top row are the hour zero models, the bottom row are the hour 24 models. Um, if you're not familiar with PP plots, any uh, the 
the um, diagonal line is what you expect under a random uh, selection of models, and deviations above that uh, correspond to enrichment of p-values, so that would correspond to um, there being some signal in the data. And here the dotted line corresponds to p-value 0.05. So you can see that when we compute an enrichment tests on each of these sets, uh, we see a, a small amount of enrichment for our hour zero models, uh, but not enough to withstand multiple testing. However, at hour 24, we see significant uh, enrichment of p-values, suggesting that, that we actually do have um, signal in our data. Skipping to sub-challenge three, our log symptom score, we actually have um, signal at both t hour zero and hour 24. And indeed, um, there's quite a strong overlap between models um, from hour zero and hour 24, suggesting that uh, um, baseline predictors are, are um, contributing most of the predictions for these models. Going back to sub-challenge two, which is a binary uh, dichotomized version of the log symptom score, we see uh, no enrichment of signal, suggesting that dichotomizing that variable uh, causes us to lose information. The, the participants were also asked to submit their uh, sets of predictors, their predictors that go into their models. Um, and if we take the top set of genes, um, sorry, the top models from sub-challenge one uh, for the hour 24 time point and do an, a pathway enrichment analysis, you can see that uh, we do see biological coherence in the sets of genes that were selected. Uh, and while there are some viral-related gene sets here, they are not necessary. Uh, these gene sets are not, by and large, um, driven by immune function. So we'll need to drill down a little bit more to understand the biology that these uh, these models are picking up. Um, and I should say that for sub for our zero and sub challenge one, uh, there was some indication of. Uh, biological coherence, but nothing uh, surpassed multiple testing. If we look at sub-challenge three um, we, and do a similar analysis, uh, the pathways picked up are, uh, by and large, immune and inflammatory related. Um. So our next steps will, as I said, will be to uh, release the two independent test data sets that we've identified. Um, uh, but in summary, the inadvertent release of our, our planned test set allowed us to invert the uh, traditional dream challenge timeline and uh, uh, experiment uh, to see if that affects um, participation. Uh, there was fairly good, there was fairly good participation um, and the community phase analysis displayed uh, evidence that there are early stage predictors for, um, for viral infection. Uh, the signal is typically stronger uh, post baseline after viral exposure, um, but in the case of log symptom score, that was not the case. And dichotomizing um, symptomatic assessment uh, resulted in loss of information. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge, in particular, our uh, collaborators on this challenge. As you all know, dream challenges uh, require a large number of people um, behind the scenes. Uh, but in particular, I'd like to thank Eth Ephraim Salik and Ricardo Hanau at uh, Duke, as well as Lara Mangraviti and Thomas Yu at SAGE. Uh, I also want to acknowledge um, our four travel award winners. We, uh, we awarded a travel award um, awards to participants based on their write-ups. Uh, and those, and uh, those four people are listed here, and three of them have posters here, so I encourage you to uh, go speak with them and learn about what they've done. And uh, lastly, thank our, our funding agency, which is DARPA.
Um, we haven't done a very thorough analysis of that, so uh, I will reserve comment until we've, we've done a more thorough examination. Does that work? I, I don't know, sure. So the, my question is like, so in this challenge actually, uh, what was the motivation behind uh, uh, using time zero data? Because this is just prior to exposure, right? Uh, immediately prior to exposure. Right. So why do we expect to get a signal uh, when using time zero data because the, uh, people are not exposed to virus yet? So what do we expect to find, find there? Right, so we're looking for um, sort of innate biology that, that confers resistance to, uh, to virus um, and whether or not we can predict um, prior to exposure whether, whether someone might get sick or not. So in a pandemic situation, you might, uh, you know, use that to stratify people who are most, most at risk um, versus lower risk. RNA challenge, one of several um, in the SMC um, ensemble. 